Hi, everybody, and welcome back to TV for Real, where reality and scripted TV collide. My name is Mike Bloom. I am joined, as always, by Sasha Joseph. Sasha, how you doing? So, so excited today. I can't wait. Listen, it's not my Achilles heel to love this person. So I'm so ready. I'm so ready for this one. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we've hit maybe the golden age of TV oh. for real as uh, we're about to hear a lot of stories today. And we've got our library card as we are joined by the one, the only from Survivor 45, Jay Maya. Woot, woot, woot. What an honor to be here. I am such a fan of both of you. And the research is impeccable. You got <laughs> deep into the discography. Oh, I'm honored. I'm honored. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, I mean, what's so interesting is that obviously this is a podcast that gets into pop culture, into media. And like you have said that your genre is nerd pop. And so I would imagine that you are someone who has taken in so much of these pop culture and I think maybe differently than a lot of the people that we've talked to on here has also kind of digested it and regurgitated it in a manner of speaking into this beautiful music. I love the word regurgitation because that is 100% what the music <laughs> is. It is just my formative childhood experiences with media being regurgitated into a microphone and then being presented to the world for, con for consumption. Um, because 100%, I feel like I... I will and we'll get into all of this but media was my Achilles heel growing up I was like super nerdy I didn't have a ton of friends and that just like formed the perfect breeding ground for like obsessions with escapist fiction and like music and just like throwing myself headfirst into all of it um and so I love it and I've like kept that love through my whole life which is why I'm just ecstatic to be talking about it with you guys today <laughs> Oh, this, this feels really exciting. Yeah, we're we're ready to go on this journey with you and, you know, talk. Yeah, talk us through this a little bit where, you know, what what were you into growing up? You know, what what were you watching? Was there anything like comfort show related? You know, tell us, tell us everything. Absolutely. First thing I'm going to say is journeys tend to not end great for me, but <laughs> I feel like today we're, we're all we're all sharing things around. much like an amulet or a sandwich. Oh my exactly, God. exactly. And if the three of us come across a sign that says take an amulet or take the sandwich, we're leaving not hungry because we're going to be taking the sandwich. We're going to be eating um, today no matter what. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we will be eating. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a wonderful question. Um, so basically like like I mentioned, I grew up, I was super nerdy, just, the, oh my gosh, I wish I could show you pictures of what I looked like from that age, like, I just did not understand so much about, like, how to present yourself as a normal person to the world, I was like, it, okay, this is, this is actually kind of, I don't know about how much I talk about this, my, my mom was so worried about, like, my social development growing up that she, she would try to bribe me with ice cream to like talk to the other kids in my class. Like, she would be like, if you have one conversation today with somebody, like I will take you to ice cream after school. She was trying so hard. Obviously things have like shifted in my life. And now I feel like funnily enough, I'm more of an extrovert than anything. But at that time, my head was just always in a book. I was escaping into fiction. I was escaping mostly honestly into reading because um, I grew up, my parents kind of didn't want my sister and I to be super exposed to like Western media beyond mm. what was on the Disney channel. So I grew up actually reading, uh, watching a lot of Bollywood films and shows and, uh, and then watching whatever was on the Disney channel. So as a result, I very much imprinted on like the Disney channel. <laughs> so I was like <laughs> watching Wizards of Waverly plays, um, the Hannah Montana, uh, victorious like this was my to me this was what western media was I was like this is the pinnacle of television why why isn't the Emmys recognizing these shows you know <laughs> these like frauds why are they not recognizing iCarly I exactly Ugh. to me iCarly deserved a golden globe and I couldn't understand how television got better than that um and honestly beyond that it was just books for me I was like reading voraciously and I think um that like desire and hunger for long form storytelling is like very much influenced how my media tastes have shifted as I've grown up because so much of my formative experience was just reading um and I was reading 
anything that was young adult fantasy you know whimsical mm. just anything anything you could get dystopian like i loved the hunger games divergent maze runner um obviously the percy jackson series um just yeah anything in that realm no pun intended i was i was all in on <laughs> well yeah it's interesting that you say like you mentioned whimsical and then you said dystopian because yeah that's yeah. the thing with like young adult fiction is that especially nowadays it really has run the gamut where i think a lot of the days of yore have been typified as like oh yeah these are like little larks that are not the best written but you know they're fun to oh my god this is like dark depressing real shit so it seems like you got a full scope and that escapism meant uh, a real breath to you that it wasn't just i'm only going to pursue like stuff that takes me away into this beautiful imaginative place like no, I want to go into this post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> that's so, I think that's so accurate because I think that's so, like, representative of, as a young person, this irony. Like, I feel like after a certain age, you spend all of your time feeling like you want to be a kid again. But then when you're a kid, all you want to do is feel grown up and, like, you're delving in and understanding real issues. And I think smart YA authors understand that desire for their audience. And so they, like balance their stories with this like like you said like really gritty realism so I actually feel and I have this like belief about the Hunger Games that it is one of the I think it's one of the greatest pieces of fiction to like come out of the last 100 years mm. um and like not YA fiction it is the greatest mm -hmm. piece of fiction it is so to me I, I haven't found a series that better like a, a, that is a better foil or mirror to society and and the way that um, specifically like war plays out in in this era um, and I just I think it's so there's so many there's so many layers to it it's so profound and what I've always really appreciated about authors like Suzanne Collins is that they don't play down to their audience they treat their audience mm. like they're the smart you know the, the smart readers that they are and I think that's why that series has been so successful and it obviously spawned this like entire genre like Divergent, Maze Runner, all of these books that were trying to like tackle these big issues in ways that felt digestible for kids um so yeah I definitely like became obsessed with that as a kid and I thought that I, you're, you're so right like I thought that I was like the most sophisticated reader on the planet I was like Harvard University I'm knocking down your door like I'm reading Suzanne Collins you know what I mean <laughs> and you did <laughs> knock down Harvard's door and then you promptly close you're like no let me put this door up I'm good right? sorry I banged <laughs> it down exactly I was lightly tapping on it and then sorry 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 oh, I'm sorry wrong, wrong, wrong number wrong number <laughs> you're just like I could so I did but I actually don't want to <laughs> Never in my life have I ever knocked down a door, figuratively or, or literally. <laughs> I, it's always been a very polite asking to, like, go through the, the gate. <laughs> so let me ask then, because as long as, like, these things have been popular, there's also been adaptations of it. Yes. Uh, are you somebody who is, like, able to compartmentalize and separate the the work that you fell in love with from, like, what you're seeing on the screen? Or do you always walk into these types of films with like the book was better is that just a, a mood you typically <laughs> fall into I have a shirt that says the book was better that I've had since I was literally 13 or 14 years <laughs> old I'm not even kidding I would wear it to school it, I was so snobby as a kid and and I'm gonna give myself grace for this but I for me the book was everything like I specifically so Percy Jackson was my greatest obsession until I was like 17 18 it was depressing mm. how late that obsession and to this day it is like I reread it every year it is every that series means the world to me um and I remember there's these I have these like vivid memories of um two two events when I was growing up the first is the first time that Rick Riordan came to San Francisco which is where I grew up I begged my parents to let me attend the book tour and I went with my my friends I got totally dressed up in costume and I got to hear him read from the series and it was so meaningful to me and I think that's one of the moments where it just like really cemented how much like writing meant to me over other forms of media um because I just I, I will always remember that specific experience of hearing him read from the book it felt so real it felt so meaningful hmm. um and then juxtapose against 
when the Percy Jackson movie came out and I walked in and I literally walked out of the theater after 30 minutes because to me, I couldn't accept that this was the adaptation of the book that I had read. Percy Jackson fans will tell you the movie is horrible. It is, it, it has <laughs> no, they cast the teenagers as like 18 year olds. Like, right. you know, what? what is her name? Alexandra, Alexandra Daddario. Daddario, yeah. Most beautiful woman on the planet had no business playing 13 year old nerdy Annabeth. It was like <laughs> to so many kids and she did a great job. Like I love her as an actress, but it was just to, for the kids that went into the theater, it was such a mismatch, like what we were expecting that it was actually like, I and I'm so dramatic, but like it was, it made me so sad and I just mm. like rejected it. And I was like, this is not part of the world that I built for myself. Um, and a lot of kids did too. And Rick Riordan famously hated it and like went very openly on talk shows and stuff and was like, I hate the movie. Now there's an adaptation right. on TV yeah. and Disney Plus that he is like in the helm for which is why it's so much better it's so much more authentic to the books but long story short no I was like book all the way the exception however was divergent because I had the biggest crush on the guy who played four. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Theo James <laughs> Theo James I loved him so much I used to like watch the clip of him talking about his tattoos on like repeat when I was like 14 or 15 I would just like press the button over and over and over again <laughs> so you're just a girl is what you're saying <laughs> yes <laughs> what about you sasha are you someone that like tries to separate the adaptation from the original work or is that impossible to do um, yes, it, no, it really depends um, on how the adaptation is done. I don't know how you how y'all feel. But right, like Lord of the Rings, right? I, I, I read it all. Um, and I talked about this last time that I'm rewatching it um, th this last two weeks. And uh, two towers, right? Vibes only. Definitely not close to the book and or like a little bit close and then the drama that comes with all of that but but it's still well made you know the movie like it's still like an exciting movie so that works but then I think about Bridgerton and uh, Kate and Anthony's story and how the book was just so much smarter um mm -hmm. which Sure, folks can have their own issues, but but it just felt like okay, and Anthony were just smarter in the books than they are here. Um, so yeah, I just I really feel like it depends on how it's presented to us. I don't know. What about you, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I've done a better job as the years have gone on of like mm. really taking the word adaptation literally, yeah. of like, mm. this is one person looking at something and being like, This is the way I want to do it. Uh, yeah. And so maybe you do get instances like the Percy Jackson series, and I'm glad that this has become a better thing of like actually bringing the creators in to be like, okay, we want to do this. Like, let us know about your vision because otherwise it really does become like, for me, it's less so about adaptations of books, but more so like adaptations of stage musicals as a big theater person. Mm -hmm. I, I was just talking on a podcast this week about uh, the Disney version of Into the Woods, uh, which is my favorite musical. And so it's tough for me because like on the one hand, obviously a lot of a lot of things will not play on stage the way they do on mm -hmm. film. On the other hand, stage in and of itself is a medium of adaptation mm -hmm. where you are yes. going to different directors, different performers are going to mount it in very different ways and it's going to look very different. So like just because it's on a different medium, why should I, you know, uh, discern things from it more than just watching a different version of it? Much like reading a book, like, if someone else reads the book and has a different opinion about it, that's their quite literal adaptation of it. I love that take specifically what you were saying about taking the word adaptation quite literally. Um, and it reminds me a lot of the discourse in the classics community about translators and what the role mm -hmm. of a translator mm -hmm. should be when it comes to ancient languages. And there's been this movement in the last like 20 or so years where the art of translation has become more and more of an art form in and of itself. And translators mm. are given a lot more room to be creative. Um, and there's like a really wonderful translator named Emily Wilson, who uh, just recently translated versions of the Odyssey and the Iliad. And her translations are being held up by scholars as like literal, just poet. It's poetry in and wow. of itself. And to me, I think when an, 
somebody who's going into their adaptation takes that mindset of like exactly like you said like i'm it's not realism it's modernism it's not i'm mm-hmm. trying to a hundred percent show you know take this adaptation and bring it to life they understand that that's not ever really going to happen unless you are the creator right unless it was your original vision all along so they're going to take some creative liberties poetic license if you will with what how they're bringing it to life like I think I respect adaptations and enjoy them so much more when I feel like that's be- that's happened. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, when mm-hmm. there, it feels like there is like love and attention and clear care for the source material being put in as opposed to like, well, this thing sold a lot of books, so we're just yeah. going to kind of put a veneer on it and put it on film. A hundred percent. And also like um, there that the, the, the straddling between love and clear and attention for the book and also like there intentionally putting their own spin on it because they understand that they're never going to bring it to life the way that everyone wants it to be brought to life. Like you said, with the stage adaptation, there's like, it, it's just inherently different because it's always going to be different. And the creator understands that and then treats that as the art form. How can I make this now its own separate piece of art that is inspired and has these important roots from the original piece, but becomes its own thing in the process. Um, I, yeah. From an adaptation perspective, are you usually, when bringing a book over to the screen, are you usually a TV series above a book person? Because I think that a large argument that a lot of people have made, maybe up until like five years ago, when really like we have just been busting all over with TV shows, is like, well, when it's a movie, they cut more stuff out. And so with a TV show, you're able to stretch it out. Is that always the case in your opinion? I love TV shows. (laughs) I think that's part of the reason I really fell in love with um survivor honestly is because of the story and the in like how enjoyable it is to see us to see episode after episode how the story continues to play out that um suspense that happens like when this episode ends and you're like what's gonna happen in the next episode (laughs) to me that is so much more representative of what like chapters are doing and like Mm. the, the pacing of a book which is part of the experience of enjoying it um and I just feel like you can there's so much more room to play with with the tv series than a movie so um, I'm sure that there are film adaptations that I've enjoyed more than television adaptations. But as a medium, I think I, if if I ever wrote a book and I was choosing a medium for it to be um, to be adap- adapted, I would say TV for me. Yeah, I I love that. Thank you. And also, you you talked a lot about language and uh, and writing, right? And um, I personally, because this is my like IRL job, uh, is I am a Jewish educator, so we we talk a lot about right, like what does language mean and translating like Hebrew and Aramaic to English, and you know how things change. So. It, Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And also, I want to know uh, from you, like, where did your then this adventure, right, of like reading and talking through everything then like translated to now where you are, where you are now doing the writing, right, and bringing all of this stuff up um, on stage? Because I was listening to a lot of your songs uh, before, too, just because I love you, but uh, in in preparation for this podcast and, and the lyrics, right, it's just the, the certain words you use. Uh, make so much more sense right with Greek mythology versus Roman etc cetera, etc cetera. so I just would love to hear yeah like when um, you know this confidence came to you right that like hey this is something I can do maybe under J Maya not Jenny but still right like what what where where did that adventure start oh that's such a thoughtful question Sasha thank you also I am obsessed with the fact that you're a Jewish ed- educator. Um, I actually, I don't think I knew that. That's so yeah, wonderful that's and phenomenal. <laughs> um, and I yeah. want to like learn more about that. Um, and I also love talking about language and the power of language. I I always say, say when I talk about like what I get to do now as my job, which uh, every morning I wake up and I genuinely, genuinely cannot believe that it is my job to mm-hmm. write songs and then put them out and then interact with the people that are listening to those songs. Um, basically, so I, when I grew up, I, I felt, so I didn't have access to social media growing up. Um, even when like Instagram, Facebook were becoming popular, that was just like our household. And I, mm-hmm. I really loved how we grew up I feel like my sister and I had really real childhoods um and I wouldn't like trade anything for that I think the one downside to it was I was engaging with all of this media 
and I had no outlet for it. Mm-hmm. I, it was just mm-hmm. going in. There was no one I could talk to about it. Nobody that I knew in real life was really engaging with the same media that I was engaging with. There were a couple of friends that I went to school with who would be reading the Percy Jackson books, but that was really the extent of it. And I just grew up with this intense desire to not only engage with the media, but um, but be able to talk about it and to be able to really understand it and uh, talk about it with people who are also really passionate about it. Mm. So I think like when I started to become, begin this journey as being an artist myself, everything that I was doing at a very early age was very attuned to the fan experience of mm. and the, the people who... I was trying to put myself in the shoes of people who were engaging with this. And I'm like, how can I make this experience the best possible experience for the people who are engaging with it? And that meant like, you know, creating discord channels, creating like opportunities for community, for people to be able to talk about it. And then I was just thinking about like the things that I really got excited about when I was younger. And it was narrative. It was stories. It was, Mm -hmm. you know, telling a cohesive story. And I think that's really informed everything that I've tried to do as an artist um this I think I've, I've already kind of like shared this on social media but um my debut album which is will come out I think quite soon at this point which is insane <laughs> to say I know it's crazy I think I'm ready. announcing the date next week which is insane um but it's like a concept driven project and there will be like a story that accompanies it and I've been scattering these easter eggs for the last year and a half in all my songs um that kind of go toward this bigger picture so it's been like incubating and in the works for years at this point because I think that's just how important story is to me um and so I think yeah the 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 short answer is like I really strongly feel like every my entire childhood was so crucial and important because I didn't know it at the time. I thought there was no way that I would grow up and be an artist or a creative myself. Right. <laughs> mm. Um, which is so funny, and obviously I'm so grateful to be here now. Um, but I was almost like going through the motions of like, okay, when I have the opportunity to be an artist when I grow up, like this is the kind of artist I want to be. And I was like taking those building blocks. Um, and yeah, and I, I've been grateful that like, it took me a little bit of time when I first started making music and coming out here to like, get my feet wet with all of it. But now I'm just so stoked. Like, I feel like, um, everything that I dreamed about as a kid that I would one day get to do is, is happening. Um, knock on wood. So yeah, oh. that's amazing. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> it is happening. It is yeah. happening. It's it's fantastic. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned the classics beforehand, because like even yeah. from outside of like a, a an immediate pop culture perspective, you know, things that came out when when you were a kid, obviously a lot of throwbacks to Greek mythology is referenced uh, in your videos, in your your music. Was that always something that you were a fan of as well? And what do you think it is about like those types of stories that still ring through thousands upon mm. thousands of years to this day. We get to talk about Greek mythology. Oh, of <laughs> course. Come on. This is your podcast. You. How could we not? Yeah. I'd be leaving money on the table if we didn't. Seriously. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, oh my gosh. And please let me know if I'm like over talking at any point, just because I get Never. so passionate How dare you? about Greek mythology. No. Um, so I've been obsessed with, with Greek mythology really my whole life it started with the Percy Jackson series as I think so many you know classicists today that are in my generation have the same origin story we were all Mm. nerds who were obsessed with I'm not a classicist but I'm friends with a lot of people who are and we you know we genuinely all have the origin story of like being nerds who are obsessed with Percy Jackson and then becoming obsessed with any Greek mythology piece of media that we could get our hands on Mm. um And it like followed me all the way into college. So I took classics courses in college. Um, My the professor that I developed the deepest possible relationship with when I was in college was a classics professor. She specialized actually in modern adaptations of classical mythology, uh, music, which is so funny. And in fact, um, through that relationship last year, I had the greatest honor of my career And I developed a relationship with the Harvard Classics Department where I come back to Harvard and I actually get to like guest lecture to students about references in contemporary music. Um, Hey, you get the chance to bang down the door again. (laughs) 
bang down. Yeah, this time I am banging down the door. Um, <laughs> and I remember to, to that question that you asked, Mike, because I think it, I found myself thinking about this a lot. Like, what is it about Greek mythology that is so sticky, both mm. for kids, but, th- but then I think also for like, for, for everyone, everyone has some Greek myth that I feel like they weirdly imprint themselves onto, they feel resonant with. Um, and this was actually the topic of this, the, the talk that I gave last year. And I remember um, the, the first, the, the kind of like crux of it was, um, it's about founding epics. Mm. So I saw this tweet, <laughs> uh, this was like a trend about like a year or so ago, which was like, you know, the Babylonians had this epic, the Greeks had the Iliad, uh, the Mesopotamians had the epic of Gilgamesh, the Hindus had the Ramayana, what is America's founding epic? And then the the meme part of it is like the bi sister James Charles video, like you input some piece of media that is like the founding epic of whatever like American media is. Very funny meme format. Um, as somebody who has never, you know, not overthought about anything in their entire life, it got me thinking. And I was like, wait, this is actually weirdly quite poignant because what is America's founding epic? Yeah. And, you know, there we have we have mythology in the sense of we have the founding fathers. We have, you know, the Declaration of Independence. Mm. We have the Constitution. But these are not stories. They're not fictional stories the way that, you know, in Odysseus, besting the cyclops is a story that a Ram, king rama vanquishing um you know king uh, evil the evil king of lanka is a story in the way that gilgamesh and and his brother enkidu um and the relationship that develops between the two of them is a story and it got me thinking just about how important story is to the fabric of civilization and society and yeah. i started doing like a lot of research on what these founding epics like what is the purpose of a founding epic a founding epic like it's a story that tells the world what values are so important to that civilization the iliad arguably a more famous more well-known story at the time (laughs) that it became the founding epic of ancient greece but the odyssey which is the iliad is a war epic the Odyssey is the story of a man who is trying to go home to his son and wife. Mm. And that became the founding epic of ancient Greece, not the glory, not the guts of the ah. Trojan War. Um, it was a story about a man. It's so human. It's so character driven. And in that way, it says, what What does it say about ancient Greece? It says that this is, you know, that these are people who are deeply connected to their family. They're loyal people at the above all, all else. The Ramayana, what does the Ramayana say? It's obviously like the the victory of good over evil, but it's also about loyalty to your country. It's about duty, which is dharma, which is so important to what like the Hindus believe about life. And so it's funny that, and then I started thinking about like how important Greek mythology is in American society, because (laughs) Americans, we don't have this. So we have to borrow it from other people. When you go to Washington, DC, what statues do you see all around the city? You see statues of Athena, you see statues of Zeus. Everything is built in the, as an homage to ancient Greece, because we are hungry as a society for something that unites us as a community and that tells us how we're supposed to live our lives, what is important to us. Um, And that is why so much of us, I think from a young age, fall weirdly deeply in love with Greek mythology because A, it's so human, it's so accessible, but B, it's something that feels bigger than us that connects us to a shared history. It doesn't matter if it's our shared history because we're a newer country, but it feels resonant in that way. Anyway, that was a long <laughs> I, we're yeah. the like, I, I am the I am in awe. This is one of my favorite conversations <laughs> I've had in quite a while. Like mm-hmm. on or off mic. Like, God, my fingers are falling off from the amount of metaphoric snaps I was giving you to that. <laughs> I mean it's it's a it's a good question though. I was racking my brain and like Me I do have a my like Sasha, are there any like what if we could pick an American epic? Do you I have a couple in mind, but I'm intrigued to see if you have any. 
I don't know that, yeah, there's an epic, right? Because I'm even thinking of fantasy, like, mm. you know, maybe that took over. And then I was like, oh, that's British. Oh, right. That's also British. <laughs> and then this and that. Um, I always think of our unfortunate, maybe, but our war stories mm. seem to mm. be our our epics, right? Like you think about, oh, well, the Civil War was a big deal. And here, and right, con- the Confederacy versus whatever else um, that felt, that feels rather. And, and I say this because I think I'm from the South where that is still such a big identity marker mm-hmm. um, and taking away that identity marker for whatever reason um, right, is dividing us um, actually. So that's really interesting. Um, yeah. I, I have so many more thoughts, but yeah, this is, this is fascinating. I, I mean, to me, maybe it's just because I'm a big freaking nerd, but the more Jema you were talking about, like, you know, what are some of the the values that are taken from other pieces and mm-hmm. that represent that culture? Like, it sounds so weird, but it sounds so American. I think the great American ep- epic is Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it yeah. represents so much, both in the moment and everything following. We're like, yes, big movie franchises existed before, but it spawned quite literally an entire universe. The themes in there, right, of like America Mm -hmm. was founded as a country of, oh, there is this evil empire that we have to overthrow and we are the good ones and we are going to do it to the point that uh, certain people from certain, you know, communities might uh, take the wrong messages from Star Wars in terms of like who might the evil empire might be. You know, it also speaks to like the commercialism aspects as well. If you talk about it from a more meta perspective and maybe Mm -hmm. what it has become and this idea of like, a ragtag group coming together unified by quite literally a central force to do extraordinary things like founded or unfounded. It sounds incredibly American to me. And it's odd because again, we're talking about like tomes that were etched in stone thousands of years ago versus like a movie that George Lucas made in 1977. But it does feel wholly American to me for a country that was celebrating its bicentennial around the time Mm -hmm. that Star Wars was released. No, I I love that. I love that. And I think it's interesting uh, what actually the both of you are now saying, right? Where in the in in this vacuum right of having this one thing that the foundational rather i should say epic instead right what what does that mean then and and i think a survivor in that way survivor's been around for mm. right 20, y'all, y'all tell me 20, nearly, nearly 25 thank years you, thank you um you know i'm not a math girly or a survivor girly <laughs> but anyway it's just you know it's been around for this long and and i always like to make a joke right like oh it takes itself so serious like in the, like it's it's like people basically naked starving on a beach like enough but but i think about this the sense of belonging um that has created over these 25 years and and you're right that that one person gets to be right the winner and like comes through you know in whatever version of the war that we go through and and how many in america have these like little pockets of their own epics like that's fascinating and and as an immigrant i think coming Mm. moving to this country um that's what i was holding a lot as well is like i you know i'm like i said i'm jewish but i grew up in india where nothing felt like siloed right like i Mm. read the rama and i read the mabar like that was normal like it and it wasn't like necessarily this religious experience you're right that it was this like story that you know yeah good versus evil or you know in Mahabharata, right like family and why it's important for families to maybe be together not fight and kill each other but anyway it's just it's really interesting and then i moved to America and, and and granted I moved to Oklahoma so a lot to say there but everything felt so siloed like oh this is our religion and this is what mm. we do and that's it right and then maybe your neighbor does something and maybe you get invited to things versus in India when something's happening everyone's invited to everything and yeah. you're just like oh it's this holiday so then I know that this neighbor is going to be inviting me and making all this food then oh it's my holiday so now I am that communal aspect of getting everyone and bringing everyone together. But you're right. It's, it's built on that foundation. And I wonder this like isolationism that happens in America, right? Is that because there isn't this like huge founding value um, necessarily that's built in a story and instead over real human, 
again, not to like drag anyone. Um, or you know, for people to be like the Ramayana is real. Yes, fair. Okay, they're they're a whole no. <laughs> I get it. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just, of we course. can like historically trace it back to these people. So that equal equals us saying, oh, well, here's why I don't believe in it versus what Mike, you're saying like Star Wars. It's not, it's a story. And that's why folks can get um, attached to it. So that's so fascinating. And I can't wait to now lead a session on this. <laughs> Yes. Well, you'd be more equipped, honestly, Sasha, no. than anyone. You're as an educator and then someone with this like super interesting background. I'm just fascinated by it. And this question of identity and how identity mm -hmm. relates to value and stories and identity yeah. formation when you're young specifically, which is I think when we when it's an age when we all kind of find the, the pieces of media that we're interested in and we start to use those to define what our identity is to our peers. Mm. Um and it makes me think about the, this idea of a monoculture. And I'm, I was like nodding vigorously with you, Mike, when you were talking about Star Wars, because I genuinely couldn't agree more with you that America creates its founding epics in real time. We are yeah. hungry. Ooh, yeah. We are hungry for it. And so Star Wars, I, I was snapping vigorously because I couldn't agree more with you. It was monoculture. Every single person in the country knew what it was. They knew the characters. They knew the values. And I think that we have many epics that come about in real time. And it, it comes back to this idea, and this is very dramatic, but the Greeks had gods. They had 12 gods. Yeah. A lot of these cultures have had gods. And we as Americans, we're looking for gods. We're looking for mm -hmm. moments in monoculture that create characters that we can see ourselves in. And Sasha, what you were saying about Survivor, when I think the big sweep of Survivor that happened when it first came out, when it became firmly a part of the American monoculture and became this like cultural talking point, yeah. that was Americans being like, we found it. We found it. This is the epic. This is a yeah. deeply American mm -hmm. thing. This is no, our thing. You know what I mean? Like, and it so ties to these values of meritocracy, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, mm. being the last one standing. Um, and I think that's why it felt so when it happened, like, oh my God, like this is, this is so exciting. This is us. This is who we are. This is our identity. And I think moments in culture happen like this. Like I think with Game of Thrones, oddly, mm -hmm. that like sweeping epic story of it, like really cemented it as like firmly in the monoculture. And I feel that the attitude with these things in society, it's not just, oh, you haven't seen Game of Thrones. You haven't seen Survivor. It's like, you haven't seen Survivor. You haven't yeah. seen Game of Thrones. Yeah. It almost feels like a personal offense if someone hasn't seen it, if you're invested in it because you know how formative it is to like, it's the thing that everyone at work is talking about on Tuesday and you don't want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, so I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think Survivor 100% has been an epic for America. Not to like, I, I, <laughs> I love Survivor. And I I, all right, Jeff, come on in. in. No, you heard right? it. You heard the magic <laughs> word. Put it on 50. Jeff Probst, a.k.a. Homer, I guess. You know? <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> You're a homer for Homer. <laughs> yes. No, Same thing about the Simpsons. So that's funny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Has, has, do you have like a favorite uh, mythological adaptation? Oh my God. Yes. Bookwise, Circe by Madeline Miller. It's because it's so human. It feels like Madeline Miller in general as an author, I feel like is writing modern day epics. Hmm. But like that resonate with our generation mm -hmm. and like the millennials and gen z and feel so distinctly human and complex um so yeah i can't speak highly enough of her i gotta be so honest the percy jackson tv show 10 out of freaking 10 i think that show is so well done yeah um you're yeah i'm obsessed with it i actually this is I go on so many Percy Jackson TV show podcasts just to talk about how much I love, I love the TV it. show. It's so fun. I, I watched a little bit of it. I, I I definitely enjoyed it. So I my own like origin story with this was that uh, when my son was like one or two years old, we like read books to him even though he had no comprehension. And like my wife is a huge Percy Jackson fan. And so she just had the series lying around. And so I was like, okay, like, I never read it before. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll read it. And so I read it aloud, and I did all the voices. You know, I did my best, uh, uh, my best, like, uh, what's his name, from who did all the Harry Potter series, Jim something. Oh, uh, 
the, 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 that guy. That guy, exactly. I was that guy. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I did a whole read through of that. Uh, Jim Dale, Jim Dale, and Stephen Fry. Uh, but Dale, then yes. uh, I was like, oh, actually, I, I mean, I was very much into Greek mythology. I had that little like big book that everybody has that we ended up buying for my son. So I just didn't have time to check out the rest of it. But I, especially compared to the movie, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, one that blows me out of the water though especially as of late i am a massive hades town fan oh me too i was gonna, I was gonna say jay if you have not checked it out like it's so in your wheelhouse it is about the myth of orpheus and eurydice and it's like folk soul jazz music like that just feels like a recipe for success in your opinion i'm obsessed with it i've been obsessed with it for so freaking long um, I, I think I like first became a fan of it in college because my, um, professor that Dr. Weiss that I was talking about earlier, she was like, when H Hades town was first being like developed regionally, she was the biggest freaking advocate for it. She was telling all of her students about it. Um, and so I remember being like, okay, well I'll check out, I'll check this out. And I think the Anais Mitchell original concept album was the first thing I listened to. And it was yeah. so freaking good. Like the music is it's just very special to me, actually. Like, so I'm a huge theater fan, and like, um, I, I, I love musicals specifically that, like, I just feel like have their own musical ethos. They're yes. building a world, and Hades Town, of all the shows that are currently on Broadway, to me, does that so freaking well. Where the music, you're not getting the music that you're hearing at Hades Town anywhere else. And so yeah. like it's building a world from scratch that like immerses the audience into something new and exciting. Um, and not to like, I, I technically am a part of it, but I, from a very nuanced perspective, I do think that this new musical called Epic the Musical, which is huge on TikTok. Yes, is... I've heard about this. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have to, yeah. <laughs> um, one of my... To very so I I do play Aphrodite in the musical so I this is gonna sound insanely biased <laughs> and I am very grateful for all the love that's on the way of the musical obviously um and I've actually known the creator of the musical we're very 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 close friends and we've known each other for three and a half years um which is insane at this point and it's been such a blessing to see I just love when my friends win it is my it is my love language it's my favorite thing in the world so seeing this musical get the acclaim that it very much deserves over the last year has been very special to witness um and i think that that musical does something and, and the funny thing is like hey town and epic couldn't be more disparate as sounds as storytelling mechanisms like it is so free an epic is a 40 song sung through epic it is yeah meant to I feel like Hades Town strips the the epic down to its most human moments, and e epic is trying to make it as big as possible. And the music is more um, inspired by video game scores than it is by like traditional musical theater. But what these two stories are doing is showing how different adaptations can be. Because there you go. Like, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. The source material, when it's so well known and people like know the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, like the back of their hand, no pun intended. And like, they know the story of uh, the Odyssey. Like they, it, it, you can play with it. You can, you can, that's where adaptation and translation becomes its own art form. And you're making something distinct with it. Um, and I just really appreciate adaptations that can do that really well, you know? Yeah, you say that everyone knows Orpheus and Eurydice, but I think one of my favorite low-key things to do on the internet is track people who are talking about whenever, spoiler alert, for a, you know, uh, millennia-year-old myth, but <laughs> every time Orpheus turns around and looks at Eurydice when doubt comes in, and, like, people tell stories about how shocked audience members are by when it happens, whether it's like them gasping and them going like, damn, or like something like that, for whatever reason, whether it's a lack of education about the story or just getting caught up in the mood, or maybe it's to your point, it's that ability to make old stories feel new again with a yes. fresh coat yes. of paint. It's able to yes. make you like sort of relive getting to experience that story all over again. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's, that's how good the musical is, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they're, 
that moment is such a big moment because of all of the storytelling that goes into it, the rising action. And I'm sure that even as an audience goer who knows what's about to happen, like you see that moment unfold and you're like, I don't know, maybe, maybe they make it through. Yeah, That'd maybe, awesome. maybe this time, despite the fact that, again, spoiler alert, <laughs> in the very beginning of the show, they say like, it's a sad song and we're going to sing it again. Spoiler alert, watch out. It's not a good ending, but they're like, we're having such a great time. What were they saying back then? Doesn't matter anymore. Listen, everyone wants a happy ending. And sometimes in your adaptation in your mind, you're like, surely they adapt it positive. <laughs> it's delusion. It's delusion. Uh, oh and my God. Such a good way to put a little it. bit of delusion. Oh my God. Listen, um, you want to be Calliope and get excited. Okay. It is what it is. <laughs> Wait, I'm upset. Um, <laughs> Also, have either of you seen Hades Town on Broadway? In no. Yes, yeah, so I've seen it. I've seen it twice on Broadway. Ugh. Oh my gosh! Were you? Were you, did you see it with Eva Noblezada and Reeve Carney? I did. I saw yes. it literally uh, about a month before COVID hit, and I'm fairly sure I actually got COVID uh, from the performance. But yeah, we ended up going for Valentine's Day, and so I saw everyone in the original cast but Patrick Page. So I ended up oh. very much lucking out in that regard. But yeah, it was it's a wild time, because we walked into that pretty blind. Um, I had not really, I, I ca caught like a couple of songs that kind of broken through on social media, but I purposely wanted to go in as unknowing as possible. And I was just like, like, I cannot speak highly. This is, this is the show that I personally like to tout for anyone who's coming into yes. town or is like looking yes. for something new to check out um it's not everyone's cup of tea you know i, I may have yes. talked with a yes. couple of reality alum who were here the past couple of weeks who said that it wasn't their <laughs> thing surprisingly but like for me between the music the staging the aesthetics like absolute 10 out of 10 would get COVID again and i'm pretty sure i did the <laughs> second time that i saw it as well <laughs> I'm That's done. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm pretty or at least i got very sick again right after i saw it uh for my wife's birthday last year so it's like you know what? Fine. It doesn't matter. I'll keep rolling the dice on this. <laughs> Is there some spell that's going on that we didn't know about? I don't know. I mean, my my health gets dragged on the road to hell every time I go in that theater, but I, I'm not going to complain too much about it. Oh Wait, God. that's so funny. Um, they like give you, they intentionally infect you so that you are left to be at home just replaying the song. That, that's exactly it. Like, I, can't, I can't move on. I can't move on. <laughs> They want you to like sit there and write fan fiction and really get into, you know, all the Reddit communities. Why not? Because you're sick. What else you got going? Exactly. Like I gotta exactly. I'll, I'll I'll start up that AO3 account and start writing slash fan fiction. I love this. I love the problem. <laughs> oh, I would get sick to to see Hades Town on Broadway. <laughs> Sasha, do you have do you have any like big mythological adaptations that ping in your heart that you know of? Oh, yeah because i'm indian yet right like every every year you have to yeah it's like the adaptation happens you go see the ramayana uh because the volley's coming up right next week so it's just and that's when the story gets told listen your girl was in the player two um for the ramayana adaptation don't worry here sasha listen i i was sita sometimes Ooh. um <laughs> with like very demure very mindful things i'm not <laughs> Um, right like just, no be serious oh, uh the so amount funny. of time the teacher had to be like you know you're like you need to be like oh shy and whatever didn't happen for me uh -oh. <laughs> that was also my fair lady so like you know i could do it guys uh but right. yeah so the ramai like again for me that was a big thing and this is like really silly and funny but, but when i first met my mother-in-law um who again i'm not south indian they are they're pretty like um i don't know the the right word but like they're they're conservative in that way um and they met me and they were asking me all these questions and i was like well you know i lived in india like longer than my husband number one and she's like right but we're hindu like duh. and i was like right i have read all of these epics like cart like my husband has not <laughs> um so it's a very just funny thinking about all of this because yeah to me like those are the stories that i always think of mm. um I was just watching. Yeah, I was just watching a show. Oh, the um, uh, the Pradeeps of Pittsburgh. Uh, everyone, please watch oh, it. It's oh my god! Comedy mystery. It's on Amazon. It's very easy watch. Um, it's it's billed as just a comedy show, but it's actually a mystery. 
I loved a it. A mystery? Yeah. It's like a whodunit comedy. Uh, so would recommend for Deeps of Pittsburgh. Anyway, so about, they talk about Donataria in in the show. And it's like a normal thing. And he's like, these talking about these two, talking to these two like country ass white people. And he's like, I'll be your like, you know, teacher. And here's why this is important. And you can be like, cause he's teaching them how to shoot bow and arrows. So to me, like these stories have always been part of my life. So it's very mm -hmm. weird. Like that, like, I don't want to personally forget them um, living in America. So I always seek out, like, adaptations. Yeah, that was so long-winded. Sorry. No, listen. The winds are, have been blowing this. It's a whole gale force <laughs> hurricane, this podcast. So, But, yeah, um, the names of Pittsburgh. Shout out. So, the names like, of Pittsburgh. Well, I just saw, like, the picture is just, like, of a family with a young child. And I'm like, this is a mystery? No, it's, it's like an immigrant <laughs> family that moves to America. Um, and the the dad uh, gets a contract from SpaceX. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling y'all, it's so funny. And the and I'm not spoiling too much. They just like come in and it's again, it's this like play on how Pittsburgh, unfortunately, right? Or like these mm. places in America aren't ready to like accept um <laughs> yeah i think that's a fair way to say it i'm ready to accept immigrants so the the immigration officer like says each person's name but he like butchers each person but it's so funny because it's a camel he calls him camel so he's like oh, it's camel and this and this and this and this and then without missing a beat the dad is like yes so i'm pradeep like they'll just they do the translation i don't know it's a very clever uh yeah i just i really enjoyed it i watched it last week Amazing. i love that um, and I so hear you on the Ramayana plays that you do growing up. Yeah. The amount of times that, like, we would get into squabbles about who got to play Sita. And then, like, one of us would play Kaike. And we'd be like, so you hate me. So you think yeah. I'm ugly and annoying. Oh, and yeah, yeah. You're trying to, like, infer what they think about you based on what you were cast as. I was also a little bit of a bully uh, growing up. Oops. So, but only to the boys. So I would, like, I would be the, like the person casting a lot of these plays and you would cast yourself as Sita. i love it <laughs> oh my god well I mean, spe speaking it. of casting i would love to bring this up for you jay so let's say that they do like yes. a scripted version of survivor 45 if they get a, a oh talk god. about adaptations <laughs> if you get the chance to cast someone to play yourself who would it be oh my god does it have to be race conscious <laughs> no you know what well our minds are open here Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I appreciate you saying that so much. Um, oh, I, I was about to pick from like three actresses <laughs> that, <laughs> that people know of. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, okay, um, my three, okay. obviously. Yeah, I, I would, I would go and say my three, Ramakrishnan. I think no, I'm just kidding. Really well. Um. Okay. Oh my god. Let me say. Oh my god. Okay. So let's dissect this. So, so. In Survivor 45, the person would have to get, would have to convey the reaction when the shot in the dark hits very well, because mm -hmm. that is the emotional climax of my arc. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to go ahead. Oh my gosh. Can I say, am I allowed to say Ayo Edabiri is my <gasps> dream? Ooh. Because she's Ooh. so good at the rate. She's so funny. I yes. would love to be played by someone funny because she would be so much funnier than I am, which I would love to see. And yeah. then I think she also, but she has the range to do the emotion because I see, I love the bear and I think she like crushes it in the bear. So she's my dream. And then I'm going to give a backup because I think I have understudy. <laughs> <laughs> she's booked and busy and you know that's like she's like oh, she so funny like i was um have you seen all her letterbox reviews right that went viral yeah. oh yeah so it's just you know she's a writer too so it's yeah just, i think it works <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed. I mean, yeah, no, I'm obsessed with her. Um, I'm actually going to pick an actress. No, no, she's so young. Okay, I'm not going to pick her. I was going to pick someone from Percy Jackson and the Olympians, but I'm like, she's like 18. I mean, we just like I put her in a world where we age her up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I love the actress who plays Clarice in Percy Jackson and the Olympians, Ooh. Dior Goodjohn. Um, I just, I think she's a phenomenal actress and is lovely and also makes amazing music that we should all go and check oh. out. Um, and is also just like a really lovely person um so i'm gonna go say my girl dior she's lovely all right and also she's like 
she's she plays like a really badass character on Percy Jackson and the Olympians, and it's like wishful thinking. But it'd be amazing to have someone who can play that play me. I'm exclusively playing actress, picking actresses who are like, <laughs> like you know, they're. Like, I just love this. Yeah, no, you're but, the you know, Jesse Cannonbaum. Fine. You're the ones that are like uh, putting these people forward. So you wish yep. cast however you Thank want you, to. Man. All I've ever wanted is. <laughs> <laughs> to cosplay as the lovely Jesse Tannenbaum. I think he's the best. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I love this. Also, uh, unrelated but related, what is your favorite Bollywood movie? Oh my god, Sasha. Okay. I know. <laughs> the soundtrack to Ye Giovanni Hey. Oh, Giovanni. yes, yes. Very much your um your epic, your generation. <laughs> That is my epic. That if I could pick an epic that has been foundational to my life and has impacted every decision. So basically this movie, it's called Ye Giovanni Hey Devani. It's about this girl. And and I'm gonna say the plot and you're gonna be like, you're gonna roll your eyes because you're this like, is this something is I really want to do on one of these podcasts, just say the plots of Bollywood movies and folks are like, this is not real. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanna hear all about this. Um, so this movie is about a girl who is like unbelievably nerdy, head in a book, <laughs> and she runs into this friend group from her high school, and they like are acquaintances, but they don't know each other really well. Of three, like they're like they were like the bad kids in high school, and they're about to leave on a mountaineering trip the next day, and they like jokingly invite her, and she's like, you know what? Screw this! I'm gonna leave my medical exams and go on this mountain trip. Leave my Harvard law delinquents. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> And go on this mountain trip to the wilderness where I am away for, for a certain amount of time and learn to, and it, that's that, that's the first part of the movie. Then she falls in love, spoiler alert, sorry, to anyone who wanted to watch this, with one of the guys from this crew. And, but like he, it just is like faded, you know, they're not meant to be together at that time. They're, they're going their separate ways. She goes back. Um, and then it fa- the second part of the movie is it's the wedding of one of the other people in the trio. So everyone gets back together like 10 years in the future. And mm. um, it's like just exploring all the dynamics after. It's one of my favorite movies I've ever watched. It literally inspired me. I took, so I watched this in high school and the summer before I went to college, I went on a, a mountaineering trip and I climbed oh. the Three Sisters mountain range in Oregon literally a hundred percent exclusively inspired by this movie oh and was my god myself. i'm crying i am dramatic and i was seeking my main character moment and yes it was phenomenal did you have the, the <laughs> fake glasses to make you seem nerdy even though you're incredibly hot like girl Bollywood is so funny because they are like I always joke that Bollywood is like ten years behind the cliches of American movies. Hundred percent. So like the trend where like the gr- the nerdy girl takes off her glasses, right? And then the she's all that. She's yeah, beautiful. yeah. Exactly. It's so that. <laughs> oh <laughs> my god! It's just it's so funny, and um, you know, back up pop culture, mess magnets time. But the actor and actress were dating, um, and she gets his. N- letter of his name r tattooed on her neck back of her neck um and then she she marries someone else uh, with a very similar name just one letter removed ranbir kapoor versus ranveer kapoor two of the biggest bollywood actors but Sasha the Lore, which I recently yes. discovered about this movie. So Deepika and Ranbir had dated prior to Yeah, Bunny, they talked but about he coffee. cheated on her. And then she had to film the movie anyway, where they were in love interest. I mm-hmm. didn't know that. And yeah. they, were freshly, they were freshly broken up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like a dog. <laughs> Wow! Yeah. <laughs> wow. Same, like surprised. perpetually, I don't want to grow up. Character like that's in every movie. Like wake uh-huh. up, kid, right? Like every movie, man, children. Is, yeah, and, and you could, and Loki, that be his life. You can't tell me otherwise. Plus, that he married now to a much younger woman, um, Alia Butt. Yep, <laughs> and Thousand much years. younger woman, and they have a baby. So you know, shout out to him. <laughs> Well, as much as I am willing to just listen to a huge deep dive about all the drama that is involved within the world of Indian film, unfortunately, we are starting to bid adieu. We've reached the final verse of this podcast. But Jay Maya, to say this was a pleasure would be an understatement. You are so beautiful with your words. I mean, it shows why you're such like a fantastic lyricist. It's just like 
when you are so passionate about something from a story to an epic to any piece of media that you talked about that is so foundational to you, like you could just feel the energy behind it. It is as electric as one of Zeus's bowls. So thank you so much for taking the time today to, to talk with us about all of your interests and your passions and beyond. And for people who want to check out all the great stuff you're doing, what do you have to plug? Oh my gosh. From such a wordsmith himself, Mike Bloom, I appreciate you so much, Mike. Um, I really felt like this conversation was a garden. We were planting seeds, Ooh, watching yes. them grow, and everything was was in bloom. And oh, oh, bloom. Um, yeah, <laughs> right behind you. Yeah, no pun intended. And um, I just wanted to thank you both for this lovely conversation. Um, I'm gonna. Oh my gosh! I think by the time that this comes out, I will have announced that my debut album is forthcoming and will come before the end of this year and you can pre-save it uh on all platforms it is a story it from top to bottom and each of the songs on the album corresponds to a chapter of the story i'm extraordinarily excited it is inspired to no one's surprise by greek mythology um so if you're a fan of greek mythology hopefully you'll be a fan of the project um and i'm just so excited for that and i have some live shows coming also before the end of the year if you live anywhere on the east coast um so i'm really excited about that as well and that's kind of that's kind of it for me um and to both of you thank you again for just such a wonderful meaningful conversation thank you for letting me rant about the classics and <laughs> percy jackson and wizards of Waverly plays for an hour i really appreciate it well so <laughs> i wish we could go on for like 100 hours about it. the pleasure was all ours sasha what would you like to plug? You mentioned a couple of uh, your previous works earlier on this podcast. Yes, um, of course. Like I said, you can always check out Mess Magnets where Kirsten McKinnis and I are talking everything pop culture, everything trending. You need to check out messmagnets.com to keep updated on what's going on in the world, all right? And, uh, of course, <laughs> uh, Matt Ligori and I are talking Dancing with the Stars. And it's been so much fun. We just had Amon come on to talk Disney night and it was truly and I still haven't changed my background oops but listen yeah. di <laughs> Disney night was so much fun and just I'm I'm really enjoying the show even though they're, they're playing me with the scores but it's fine and it was really fun though and for everything else of course just check out my Twitter at fun size underscore oh four and what about you Mike you and my usual survivor ish uh we have reached the point where Jay Maya was taken from us in uh, Survivor 47 uh, went out in a very different explosiveness, I would say, than than you did, but still going to be uh, a lot of fun to talk about all of that on the b, &B this week. I'm covering the Penguin and Battlestar Galactica over on the scripted side of things. I'm, I'm, do, I'm around. I'm doing stuff. You can check out everything I'm doing at a Mike Bloom type. And of course, check out everything going on here on TV for real on We Know Scripted TV as next week. Sasha and I will be back with another reality star talking their taste in all things scripted. Thank you all so much for listening. This was such a great conversation. Jay, Maya, thank you so much. Truly such a pleasure. We'll be back next week for another edition of TV for Real. Until then, everybody, it's been real.